Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I could uh, have your attention. I'm Richard Edelman, and I welcome all of you to the launch of the Mid-Year Edelman Trust Barometer. And um, if any of you are feeling slightly unreal or otherwise, um, we are back. This is real, <laughs> and I am happy. Um, so I'm joined on the stage today by uh, Thoral Barker, who will moderate um, from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Helva Thorning Schmidt uh, is former Prime Minister of Denmark. Uh, we have Professor Kishore Mahbani, um, who teaches uh, in the Asia Research Institute in Singapore. Dr. David Nabarro, uh, Special Envoy for COVID-19 from the WHO. Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, um, who runs Inclusive Capital Partners. And Brad Smith, President and Vice Chair of Microsoft. So I'm going to go straight to the story, because that's why you're here this morning. Let me set the context for trust. We've been doing this for now 22 years, and the major trends over that period of time are NGOs, historically, were the most trusted institution in the world for 19 years. In a certain way, a vote for the other, not media, not government, not business. Government had a brief period of leadership during the height of the pandemic in April 2020, uh, with a huge surge of trust based on being the only one with the big bazooka. Um, then, business emerged as the most trusted institution in January 21 and maintained that position in January 22. Today, I can tell you that uh, the state of trust is that, in fact, business is the most trusted institution in the world still, that uh, NGOs are second, not exactly close, um, government a trailing third, and media a distant fourth. Um, it is business over government in every democracy. It is government over business in every autocracy. Note that there are big trust gains in the last period in four markets, US, UK, uh, and Germany in particular. Now, very important how those trust gains came. Those trust gains came because of the top three quartiles of income. The bottom quartile absolutely flatlined. The trust gap between the highest quartile and the bottom quartile has never been larger. I will give you some eye-watering numbers about the trust gaps in certain countries in the world, led by the United Kingdom at 34 points, followed by Germany at 28 points, France 23, US 23, Japan 21. We have never seen numbers like this before. Our hypothesis, the bottom quartile is being pinched by inflation, cost of living, fear of job loss, uh, worse outcomes from the pandemic, and they've never recovered. This is the tinder on the floor of the world situation. With one spark, this is going to be populism and yellow vests and more. There's also a very clear sense that business has moved beyond its economic responsibility to societal issues and now, for the first time, geopolitical issues. Statistics. 85% of our respondents who were in 14 countries, 14,000 people, said the number one job of business is still make jobs, innovation, growth, 85%. The second, however, very close, is societal, which is sustainability, diversity and inclusion, inequality. That's second. But third, for the first time, geopolitics. 60% told us we expect business to punish countries that violate international norms. There's also a fascinating rise of home brands. Trust in my country's brand has risen as a result of Ukraine. US and UK in particular, 11 and 13 points specifically. In general, home brands are now 25 points more trusted than foreign brands. That is a new phenomenon. It is a new nationalism. It is a new sense of turning in on ourselves. Brand China is now the lowest 
it's been ever in the history of our survey. 30% trust. Only kept up by high trust in India, Middle East, and in home market. The Ukraine. I've saved the most important statistics for the middle of the presentation in case there's any attention slump. Um, <laughs> so the Ukraine invasion. Why get out? Why did a thousand companies get out of Russia? This unprecedented reaction, when you compare this to South Africa, for example, which took 20 years to get 200 companies to slowly withdraw from an apartheid-run country. Basically, 31% jump in trust for those companies that left. And for those companies that stayed in Russia, a 38-point drop in trust. Every sector is expected to leave Russia. There's no pass given for pharma or for food. No pass. No ability to stay. In fact, nearly 50% of consumers told us that they have bought or boycotted brands because of what the parent company did about staying in or leaving Russia. Similarly, employees told us, I am a quarter more loyal or 25% more likely to advocate for my employer if we got out of Russia. But it doesn't stop with this idea of an invasion. The broad brush of geopolitics is the new force that business is going to have to confront. If you think of business as a juggler, you are juggling two balls, economic performance and societal issues. Now, you have three balls. <laughs> And for those of you who juggle, harder to do. Statistics. Repressive government, 95% say, get out. Abusive labor practices, 97% say, get out. If it's against the national interest of your headquarters market, 60% say, get out. These are big new mandates for business. This is not easy. This is really complicated for the job of the CEO. So, as CEOs, trust has risen, as responsibility has come to my CEO because trust has moved local. It's moved from top down to peer to peer to now local in my company, in particular in response to the societal issues of the last years, again, diversity and inclusion, sustainability. Listen to the new jobs of the CEO as to do with geopolitics. 60%, draw a moral line in the sand do not participate in countries which violate moral norms. Use your voice on human rights reforms, 61%. Shape policy for your home country related to geopolitics, 70%. Big stuff. So let me try to conclude and frame this for you on the horizon of trust. I think business has been given too many jobs. We are now at the point of being unable to do everything that is expected of us. Why is it so? Because government is so unable. Business is seen as 50 points more competent than government. That's why we keep getting assigned these new tasks. But in a moment where we start to see recession impending, where there are gonna be real choices to be made for CEOs about how am I going to keep people working? Can I keep people working? Where are they going to be working? We're going to have to make the tough calls. You can't juggle these three balls equally in a recessive environment. It is my prediction that we're going to have to orient to running a good business first, societal second, and geopolitical third. There will be pressures on each of you to manage these multiple balls, but you have to go in with a concept you can't just be reactive and hoping for the best. In short, I believe that in the next phase, trust will continue to be largely in business, but business faces a moment of great peril because of the breadth of responsibility placed on our shoulders. Thoral, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so we are going to have a half hour discussion of this and then come to you guys for your questions. So please have a think about that as we go through. But I want to kick off with Hella. Um, 
Richard started with this huge gulf between uh, the poorer end of society and the richer end of society when it comes to trust. Can you just give your perspective on, on what's driving that and, and what the, the, the answers are? Well, first of all, great to be here. Thank you to uh, Richard and Edelman for doing the, the trust barometer year after year. I think it's an immensely useful tool for all of us to understand what's going on in the world. And it's, it's true to add to, to what Richard was saying, that we have this um, issue now where we have the poorest people not trusting anything. And that's not one country, that's everywhere. The problem, there are many problems with that. But one big problem with that is that it actually um, vacates the middle of politics because if you don't trust anything, you tend to go to the extreme of politics. And then means we have this vacated middle of politics, and that plays into what Richard was, was just saying, which is that if you don't have strong politicians that can meet in the middle, the politicians will tend to hide behind business, which is extremely trusted, and, and oftentimes asking business to do politicians' jobs. That's what's happening right now in Russia. There's so many incidents where Russia is not sanctioned to all the extent that business is asking, asking to leave Russia, but business, because it is the most trusted, because um, we don't trust politicians so much, is actually asking to be at the forefront of that, and that's the, th the three-ball juggling that Richard is talking about. This is a huge problem, and in many ways, business has become the victim of its own success and can only look into a future where the juggling of these, things, uh, these balls will not be possible. Today it's Russia, and perhaps business have survived leaving assets in, in the Russia, giving them to the Russians, and leaving Russia without politicians pressing them to do that. But tomorrow it might be China. Uh, China will actually do all those things that we are talking about, for example, um, annex uh, Taiwan, which they consider to be their own territory. What is the world going to do? Are we going to have a similar situation where politicians are hiding behind business and telling them, get out of China, do it right away, leave your assets, and is that fair? So that's why this is the right time to have a really serious debate with politicians, asking them to sort out, uh, sort out what we're going to do in China. If I was business person in this Davos, I would find the 10, 15 senators walking around Davos and start talking to them because we have a huge problem. The divide means that there's no politics that can unite us. The middle is dead in many countries, in the US particular, and that means that business have to take, take this huge responsibility. Is Russia now, it'll be China next. Fantastic. We'll go on to that question of, of what business should be doing um, around some of these bigger issues down the road in a second. But David, can I just ask you about um, the question of inflation right now, particularly at the bottom of society when it comes to food and energy? And, and what is the implication of that, both in the places like the UK and the US, where this trust deficit is huge, but also in, in developing markets as well? Thanks very much. Uh, for the last two and a half years, I've been working on COVID, and I'd like to then uh, just share one thing about that and take it into the food sure. and energy situation. Do you know, the one thing that I've always known as a public health doctor is that if you want to help people to keep free of a disease, it has to be a partnership between authorities and the people. If it becomes adversarial, then it gets really difficult. I found this when working on Ebola in West Africa, where my tutor on this was the, the president of Liberia, and I found it working on COVID all over the world. You create a sense that somehow the people themselves are wrong and then they actually say, OK, I don't really want to be part of this. And the trust gulf suddenly widens enormously. And you, we've had a, a difficult COVID in this world. It's hurt poor people all over the world really hard. And we're just starting to understand 
how much COVID has led to a fracturing of the social relationships that are absolutely vital for the 20% who are poorest for their survival. Simply, a lot has broken. And so, in September last year, we started to notice all over the world that food prices were starting to go up. And with them, because of energy also starting to go up, we saw fertilizer prices going up. And then alarm bells started to ring. Why was there this sudden shift happening? And our own view is that it's because of these fractures in society everywhere, Thorold, that led to many, many aspects of the relationships and the working of poor people, poor farmers, SMEs, poor people living in urban areas. It just isn't working for them. Now, I think the world just can't tolerate a situation where poor people are disenfranchised and are not able to do all the things that is necessary to keep our economies going. And that, but that's what's happening. And all over the world now, we have increases in the cost of living associated with fragmentation of the lives of poor people, exacerbated by climate change, and now, of course, the war in Ukraine. And that means that having had a bad COVID, we're now having a much worse cost of living crisis. Our calculations are that 94 countries are threatened by this with a prospect of either severe hunger or even famine. And 1.7 billion people are living in countries which are facing these risks. We don't know, Thorold, where it's likely to go, but I put it to you that this cost of living crisis could lead to the worst set of economic and social challenges that we've seen perhaps for four or five decades. I think it's serious and I think it needs collective attention right now. COVID started it, climate change exacerbates it, conflicts absolutely make it worse. And with the costs rising and rising and rising, just millions of people are suffering, suffering really badly. We'll know how bad it is when the history is written, but can we not notice it while it's happening and work together to try to deal with it. Just before we go on, just quickly, so Richard talked a lot about what CEOs shouldn't do. They should get out of countries when there are problems. What is your, just very quickly, what's your view on what CEOs should be doing proactively to help on this topic? I hate, I hate making advisory remarks that uh, co cover a lot of people, Thorold, so I just apply it to myself and those who I'm working with. Look at all aspects of your operations and ask yourselves, what are the decisions that we can make that will least damage the well-being of the 20% poorest people who are either in our supplier community or in our customer community or with whom we're trying to maintain relationships? Look at everything with that 20% poorest lens. It's not charity, it's the future of the world. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, Kishore, can you just give a quick um, perspective from Asia on this? We've talked quite a lot about Western countries where there's this huge divide. Can you give a perspective? You live in Singapore, and obviously you're an expert on China and other countries in that region. Can you give your perspective on how you see it? Uh, thank you. It's, since we're discussing trust, let me say that one good thing in the field of trust is that trust in the Edelman Trust Barometer has gone up. <laughs> <laughs> so at least we have a reliable indicator of where we should, uh, what we should be looking at. And I guess from the Asian point of view, it's important to emphasize that half the population of the world lives in Asia. And most Asians see the world differently from the way that the West sees the world. Let's be very, very clear about that. And you want a leading indicator of this, it's China. Because very clearly, especially in the United States, has decided, and we can go into the merits of it, that it's going to try and stop China from becoming number one. That's very clear. And I'm glad, Hala, you raised it. What are the consequences for business and so on and so forth? But for most of Asia, China becoming number one is a given. 
It was number one for 1800 of the last 2000 years. It's just a natural return of Chinese civilization after 200 years of sleeping. And so the rest of Asia is busily integrating with China. And as you know, in January this year, the world's largest free trade agreement, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership took off with 15 countries, 10 ASEAN countries, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. And what's going to happen, therefore, is a massive integration of the region. So if the United States tries to decouple from China, and if United States business tries to decouple from China, it is actually decoupling from a much larger region. And therefore, the consequences are much more serious. So Hella is absolutely right when she says that businesses should start thinking if you have a Russia-type situation, and it need not be Taiwan, it could be any other issue, right? And then suddenly you, you, you face the political pressure to disengage from China. Now, I want you to do a quick mental review of the biggest companies in America and ask them what would happen to them if they withdrew their production from China. Where would Apple be? What would be the value of Apple today if we just took off all this production from China? And you cannot replace the manufacturing ecosystem that China has created. Now, the reason I emphasize this is that if you see that a big problem is coming down the road, don't pretend it's not happening. It's real. So businesses should be proactive in trying to engage the government and say, hey, let's work out a credible long-term policy for managing our relationship with China. It cannot just be a zero-sum game. It's got to be clear where the United States can disengage and where it cannot disengage, and then try to work out a viable long-term policy. OK, I think we'll, we'll get on to China in one second, which is going to be, I think, a, a, an interesting debate. But just quickly, so, so this gap of trust mm. that we've been talking about in the West, that you don't see that existing so much. Well, the reason why it doesn't exist so much is that if you look at the conditions of the bottom 50%, the bottom 50%, as you know, in the United States has seen a stagnation in standards of living over the past 30, 40 years. So it's been documented, I documented in my book, Has China Won? And I think Richard made a very important point. I hope you all notice a key word he used. He says it will just take one spark and this anger of the bottom 50% will explode. Now, the conditions of the bottom 50% through most of Asia, including the two most populous countries of China and India, and if you include the 680 million people in Southeast Asia, the bottom 50% in, in this region for the past 30 years have been the best 30 years in maybe 3,000 years of history. So the bottom 50% therefore has a lot of hope for the future and they see better things coming. And if you see better things coming, you're not going to go out and burn down Okay. So let's, let's, thank you, that's incredibly helpful context. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on to the, the question of um, sort of CEOs and what companies need to be doing um, in these situations. Russia was a pretty clear cut situation of, of aggression where I don't think there was a lot of questioning around you know, where the line was drawn on that. But China is a much more complex question for companies. Brad, how do you think about this issue of uh, CEOs being expected to engage in geopolitical questions around the world and how navigable that is given how interconnected the world is? Well, I, <clears throat> I would say two things. First, I think you could just sort of synthesize a little bit about what has been said so far, which is just frankly the extraordinary time and decade in which we live. You know, we started with this pandemic and then we added a war. Now we add you know, the, uh, concerns about food supply and then we have climate. And, you know, it's like this box that, you know, feels like it's shrinking all around us. You know, as we're living in sort of a vice, if you will. And then your know, businesses, all of us, no matter what we do, have to live our lives and navigate in between these pressures. Then you get to, well, what is the role of business and what does this year's survey say about, say, the role of business leaders? To me, the number one thing I see when I read the results is frankly that I think business leaders should read these results with a large dose of humility. Because there's this other factor that Richard alluded to, which is what people really value is proximity. If they don't know what to believe, they focus more on who to believe, and they believe people they know. 
So if you look in general about you know, whether people are trusted, CEOs as a whole, it's 49%. My CEO, people say, well, that's 66%. That's 17% higher. Now, before any CEO gets too excited about this, I think there's something else worth noting. People are eight points more likely, 74% more likely to believe their coworkers than their CEO. So if there's three people sharing a desk who graduated from a university last year, they're more likely to be believable than the CEO who's leading the company. So that, to me, is cause for humility. The other thing is, yes, there is a greater expectation that, say, business leaders and CEOs and companies will address a broader range of issues, but there are still some very sharp limits. If you look at it, 76% expect CEOs to speak out about jobs in the economy. Makes sense. People expect business leaders to know something about jobs in the economy. But only 40%, a 36% gap, 40% say, oh, I want to hear what CEOs think about you know, who should be the next leader of, of my country. Not so much. So you know, it goes back to another point that Richard alluded to that's made clear in the survey. I think people want business leaders to provide information about what they see, the problems they understand, data, information that can be more trusted, not necessarily to rush around and tell everybody what they should do. OK, and if it comes to these more contentious questions, and we, we heard here about, um, <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> excuse me, Richard was talking about how CEOs are told that they, if anyone flouts international norms, they should get involved. I mean, if you look around the world, do you, do you just disagree with that fundamentally, that, that they should be getting involved in, in these situations that aren't as clear-cut as, as Russia? No, actually, to the contrary. I think that companies have to basically be clear about the values for which they stand. So if you take a, it has been raised already, a more kind of nuanced question around China, let's say human rights in China, for example, how should people address that, given the importance of China, the interconnectedness of China? Well, I'd say two things about that. I mean, first of all, I think people want to know the values for which we stand. That's different from telling you the values for which you should stand. There's a difference about being clear for yourself and lecturing everybody else. The second is, while I appreciate the point about China, access to any, any market is not a decision that is made exclusively by the business. The real question is, how will the government in China feel about the future of consumer brands that can be closed down in a day when another government imposes sanctions? It's a two-way street. There's a lot to unfold. Many businesses, when they closed shop in Russia, did so at the board level with the recognition they were not making a decision about Russia alone. They understood that other governments, especially authoritarian governments, would likely look at them differently in the future. So I, I just think that there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot that will need to evolve. And it's not just what any particular individual or business wants. It's about how a lot of factors come together in a time when there are more factors colliding with each other than probably any point in our lifetime. Can I just add a quick point? Sure, please, Kishore. But at the end of the day for businesses, Markets matter. In the year 2009, the size of the retail goods market in China was $1.8 trillion, and the United States was $4 trillion, more than double the size of China's retail goods market. Ten years later, and this is 2019, this is two years after Trump's trade war, when he had imposed tariffs and everything, the size of China's retail goods market had gone up to $6 trillion, more than three times, and the United States retail goods market was $5.5 trillion, smaller than China's. And I can assume, you can assume that 10 years from now, it will be like $10 trillion. So are you going to lock yourself out of the world's biggest market while the rest of the world is locking itself into the world's biggest market? What are the business implications for that? So I think if you're running a business, yes, you've got to pay attention to values, you've got to pay attention to human rights, but you also got to pay attention to your bottom line, and you also got to pay attention to where your competitive position will be 10 years from now. And you, if you talk of brand, uh, home brands, Richard, earlier, 
you know, the largest market for French luxury products, I think, as you all know, is China, right, today. And so if you go for home brands, that's really going to damage a lot of global brands too. And the advantage that Western companies have is that they have clearly a much greater hold on most global brands than any other companies in the world. And at a time when the world's economy is going to go through this fastest growth phase over the next 10, 20 years with new markets emerging, this is when your global brands are the most useful and the most trusted. This is when you should be using them. And then if you pull them out, what are the consequences? But I think there's a factor one needs to consider in this. Mm. Luxury goods like scarves and purses mm. are not political. Mm. They don't have an impact on domestic politics. Mm. Newspapers, yeah. the media, social media, mm. technology, communications. Look, this whole topic is, is really about trust, polarization, lack of confidence in what people are, are reading and talking about. And, and so you know, for companies that operate in any of those spaces, one question may be what you want to do. <laughs> There's a very different question. What are governments prepared to let you do? And long before you know, Microsoft stopped selling new products and services in Russia in the wake of a war, LinkedIn was gone from Russia. And that was both you know, a, a question of LinkedIn, but it was also a reflection of the decisions that the Russian government was making, the censorship demands that they were imposing, the constraints that basically made it untenable to do business there. So over time, I'll say over the next century, ultimately, let's assume that GDP mostly correlates with population. Every country that has the most people will have the highest GDP. But that doesn't mean that it will be possible for every industry to operate in every country on, on the same basis. Let's, can, can I just bring in, and we'll, we will, this is very interesting, so I don't want to break it up, but I, I want to bring in Alan quickly, um, and then Lynn on the investor side. Um, Alan, what's your perspective on this? Um, you're based in the Middle East, you have a different um, uh, view on the world. Uh, what's your perspective on uh, to what extent business and, and, and business leaders should get involved in these issues? Well, look, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> I don't think we really have a choice, but we definitely have, uh, we have varying degrees of, uh, of, of, I would say, equity, depending where you are and, 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 and what's happening. So if you look at the world from Asia, uh, yes, it's a reality. There is a different view about how the world is going, how the world should be going and what actually matters more than anything else. If you look at the world from the Middle East, that's also a different view compared to what we're seeing currently. And we've seen that a reflection of that in the stand, stand that we're taking, where people continue to believe, I think, in the Middle East generally, that actually we should continue to find ways to talk to each other and basically work through this situation, rather than, uh, abandon, uh, rather than move forward uh, in, in a more polarized situation. And when you, when you reflect on how the, the, the barometer and the trust barometer is moving, what we're seeing today in terms of responsibilities on businesses and CEOs is a natural progression coming from the fact that we have seen more and more trust in the relationship between the brand and the customer. The brand stands for much more in terms of what they mean to the customer uh, as opposed to where it used to be a few years back or let's say a decade ago. And because this is the case, people want us to actually not to disappoint them. And this is really a very personal relationship that is trust-based between me as a customer and the brand. I don't, do not want the brand that I identify myself with that, that actually means to me to disappoint me in terms of where I stand and where I'd like my brand to stand. So in reality, customers are making decisions for us. There is very little that you can do. And to tell your customers, yes, we understand your position, but in reality, we have something else also that matters. This is not what the customers, they're not going to cut us so much slack. On the other side, what I want but, to say. But just on that, um, yeah. it's not always clear cut. So in some cases, there'll be some customers who think one thing and some customers who think another. Yes, How of course. How do you deal but, with that? But I think we're talking today in the context of the, the, the huge issue, okay, which is Russia's aggression on Ukraine. This is not a stand, uh, what people are asking us to do is not to take stand against Russia. People are scorched by what happened. This is such a big, uh, this is such a big move that actually have, have 
caused people to really have this extreme reaction. I mean, three months ago, six months ago, people had no issue. Russia wasn't a different country. People had no issue with uh, all the brands that actually pulled out of Russia to be in Russia. This is more basically a, a form of, prote of protestation against actually what's happening today. And I think that I would not look at a, a similar situation in terms of uh, and China, for example, and what China could do without factoring what would be the global reaction depending of actually what China does. No one is asking anyone to just move out of China because it's an autocracy or to move into another country because it's a democracy. It's really based on the action that these governments are taking and basically how much of these actions are actually scary for people in 2022. It's not something that you could even fathom anymore. So it's very difficult to say you will not be able to do elsewhere what you've been doing here because this is a less important market. There is definitely a dimension about that. But as CEOs, in my opinion, we have to meet the expectation of our customers. Yes, we can shape them in a way, but at the end of the day, we have to meet the expectation of our customers. And let me tell you, will our customers, let's say in markets uh, that are subject to uh, extreme, extreme uh, situations, okay, be happy? for our brands to continue to be there as if nothing happened, I'm not sure as well. I mean, no one talked about how does, how do, sorry, the, um, for example, the Russian customers feel or the customers in Russia feel about what's happening. Because we don't have information about, very little information. Some of the brands that are there can tell you what they have seen and what it means. But in reality, we have seen people as well, whoever could leave left because they are also unhappy what it is. So I wouldn't take, you know, the word as divided into two clear-cut camps. Mm -hmm. There are different views even within the markets that are subject to, uh, to, to, to these situations. So I would say, in short, the CEOs and businesses have simply to meet the, the expectation of their customers. This is not optional for us. We have to basically uh, stand up for the values that we live by. It's not optional. You cannot be a brand or a company that matter if actually you have optionality for when you stand up for the value that you live up to and when you actually don't. This, these, these, these times are gone. This is what we stand for and we have to make it when the choices are hard. And I think it's very important for the world to understand that we live in a different world. We are not anymore in the 60s and the 70s. We are in the 22nd century and people expect us to actually come through. So Lynn, what's the investor perspective on this? We've, talked, we've heard a lot from um, people in business and, and in policy. What's the, your investor lens on this? Well, first of all, I want to thank Richard and the Edelman organization for doing this really important work. I mean, everybody should pay attention to these numbers. They are profoundly, for me, surprising and important. And to put that in some context, and this relates to the investor question, I was here in 2008 when the Edelman Trust Barometer really told us exactly where we were going that trust and capitalism was falling apart. We didn't have ESG funds. There wasn't a purpose movement or anything like that. But if you go back and look at what Edelman uncovered with respect to trust back in 2008, and we, we ignored the fact that we could not put into place policies that were gonna benefit the, the rich and hurt the worker, um, we would have made a lot of different decisions as CEOs. So I think that this, this, this insight today on how customers, employees, investors are viewing corporate obligations with respect to everything from inclusivity, sustainability, yes, geopolitics, is really important, so we have to listen to it. Um, I would say the investor perspective on trust is that that i think it's 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 a little bit of a, a, a bifurcated i think that on some levels investors are being hoodwinked by the esg industrial complex the check the box I'm ESG, I'm clean, I take care of my people, here's my glossy. 
And I think that's why you see governments rising up and saying to investors, what are you doing to engage with companies that, that say that they are pursuing purpose but are not? So I think that's happening. But at the same time, I think there's real change in the boardroom. I mean, I, uh, on many corporate boards over the course of my long life, um, too many CEOs who I've known from Davos have moved on and there are new CEOs now, I'm feeling very old. Um, but, but now we actually do talk in the boardroom about what are our values. And I feel very proud of the private sector, the way a thousand companies stepped up to act in Ukraine. And let's make sure they're really acting. By the way, there are some companies that made statements that are not acting. And we should, you should, as, as the media, you and Jeffrey Sonnenfeld and everyone else should expose the hypocrites. But the truth is that companies acted way beyond what they had to do for sanctions. And I think that's because of this board level understanding that the world, investors, employees, communities, policymakers are looking at what are your values and are you practicing them? I think if Ukraine had happened in 2008, the business community would have been asleep. Um, so uh, the investor side yeah. is really important because we cannot expect CEOs to raise their head above the parapet on anything from climate to improving worker conditions, to worker training, all, all these things that the trust barometer and this, this report released today, 78% said people expect companies to take care of inclusivity and sustainability. That's huge, but we've got to actually do it. But do you think that- And it's a virtuous cycle when investors invest behind companies that do it because the companies are actually proving the way. Um, and uh, I mean, Microsoft is a fabulous example of a company that changed its culture and created enormous, cult uh, enormous shareholder value. So that's what we're looking and, for. And, and do, you, do you worry that this, uh, what, what's happened with Ukraine and the very, very strong reaction, which has been, been great on this, raises expectations uh, to a point where next time a country does something, even if not so egregious as what Russia has done, there will be this very inflated expectation for business people to act in a way that hasn't been there before. How do you think it'll play out into the future for me? I think it's for every company and every board to decide, and I think Brad said it right. I mean, a company needs to say, these are our values. We are willing to take this hit to get out of Russia or to pay our, our employees more or to extend worker benefits. Because in the long run, we are going to be a more trusted company. We are gonna be a long-term brand. We're gonna be a place where the best people wanna work. So um, you might have a different view. You might want Putin to do what he's doing. You might want Georgia to do what they're doing. But for us, we need to make a stand of where we are. Because remember, the corporation is not, it wasn't invented by God, we're created by God. But the corporation's created by society. It's a, it's a fiction, right? We get limited liability as investors because society wants to give that to us. That's a huge give. And if we lose the trust, which is why all this work that Edelman does is so important, we could lose our, our license to operate. That's not a given, that's not God given. So we have to state what we are and be true to who we say we are. And I will say again, from the boards that I'm on, that's the way we talk about it. Good, can I? Yeah, I was actually gonna ask you a question. Yes, Would that be okay? I mean, you can ask me a question great, if you yeah. like, but um, <laughs> we're gonna to go to questions in the audience one second, but just going back to your point, you raised Taiwan, for example, mm -hmm. earlier on. Um, what's your perspective when it comes to China? And, and you know, obviously, pulling out of Russia is one thing for companies. China is a whole different game. So can you just expand on that a little bit, having heard from everyone? Yeah. What I think we need to realize is the massive reaction there were around Russia. Everyone totally agreed what had to be done. And businesses were asked by customers, clients, shareholders, everyone to go beyond 
the sanctions regimes to be in front of this. I think that Russia is just the first example of this, and the next example is the bigger world. And what do we think about as the biggest that can happen? That is that China oversteps our values in a way that we need to react really quickly, and that, that discussion comes into the boardroom. And to a certain degree, I'm not sure I agree with Lynn and Brad when they say, well, we have our values and they have their values. The problem here is when these values collide. And that, and that our customers, our clients, whoever is our shareholders and stakeholders expect to, uh, to us to act really forcefully on our own values. And I don't think it's unlikely that that can happen sooner rather than later in terms of our relationship with China. So my best advice to business leaders, I sit in the boardroom as well and try to convey this message as well, is to actually start finding out what are we going to do. Because it's not sustainable to leave China. It is not good for the poorest in the world to leave China if we talk about it like that. So in order to, our, to live up to our responsibility to the poorest people in the world, to our employees, uh, to the global community, we have to find a way to work with China. And our politicians have to step up to do that. So that's what we should be asking them to do now. And this blind boycott of everyone, uh, if we don't agree with them, I'm not sure where it gets us. I sit, and this is a, this is a short, long story, um, I sit on the, uh, on the Ethics and Governance Committee of the National uh, Football Association, soccer. Um, right. And one of the things we debate a lot is why we have a tournament, a world champion tournament in Qatar. This is a big deal. And we keep discussing that. Why should we not boycott this tournament? Why are we going in the first place? And this is just a micro discussion about the discussions we are having. I'm on the side, let's go. You can't always go to fully democratic nations. You can't go to uh, every, somewhere where they have a complete dem democratic values. That's like 8% of the world's nations. So we have to find ways of working with nations that don't share our values, but our politicians have to be pushed to be in the forefront of this. And they can't hide behind business, which I think they're doing now. Good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions on that one. So I, I'm going to go to questions now, but I just want to ask Brad one thing before I do, which is uh, the, one of the other things that came through on this was this um, focus on local, uh, of, of brands being, or companies being expected to act on the interests of their um, local countries, but also being more trusted locally as well. Um, obviously, some of these other uh, things we've talked about, such as pulling out of Russia and some of the challenges in the future about acting geopolitically, um, are we seeing this sort of act against globalization? Are, are we going to see a pressure to, to pull back to these, these more domestic markets? Or as a, as a multinational, do you see that, um, that global perspective continuing um, to flourish? Well, I think, again, we're seeing these tensions Globalization is certainly not as alive and well in 2022 as it was in 2002 when you started. Um, that's sort of one of the, the themes in, you know, of, of this year. And obviously, this conversation is about you know, what does the decision to withdraw from Russia mean for <clears throat> other markets? I think most businesses aspire to be as global as they can be for good reasons. You have this notion that you should go and serve the consumers and customers of the world. But at the same time, um, there does need to be a set of values. And I think at the end of the day, most governments have some expectation that the companies headquartered within their borders will reflect the values of their nation and their society. And so you've got to figure out how to navigate these. I do think myself, that the world came together after World War II and genuinely endorsed a set of values that people consider not only to be global but universal, the protection of fundamental rights and the like. And, you know, and, and when you think about you know, what the world did in saying that civilians needed to be protected even in a war, you know, that value, that principle is on trial in 2022. So you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, businesses need to perform financially and they need to perform with an eye towards a set of values, ESG values, if you like. 
and you don't get a pass on one if you do poorly on the other. Really, what you have to do now is do two things well, not one thing well. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we have 10 minutes. There's a lot that we've been talking about. Do people have any questions to follow up on any of that here at the back? Conversation. The other T word hasn't made it into the conversation, that is transparency. In survey after survey after survey that we've done on drivers of corporate reputation and drivers in particular of trust, industry across industry, it comes down to transparency. Lynn talked about it a little bit but didn't actually use the T word. And I'm just curious uh, for comment on, on where transparency fits in all this. Hmm. Who is that to or anybody? Well, I'd, I'd like say, to. I, I'd just say, I think it's probably the bedrock principle on which everything else stands. I <clears throat> find it fascinating that in the world today, when there's so much questioning of whether something that you read is true, we actually don't live in a world where companies publish their quarterly results and people go to the water cooler the next morning and ask, gee, I wonder if those were accurate. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, it, 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 it's called. Trust but verify. Companies have to report. Results need to be audited. They're subject to regulation. And you know, I think that what has worked well for business in the world of financial reporting is increasingly being applied to broader ESG issues, and that's a good thing. I love the T word. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to go to the lady at the front in the, in the blue, please? Thank you very much. Um, I would have a question on the um, relationship between values and geopolitics. And um, given that there's more than 20 active conflicts, war going on in the world, which don't get as much attention as the Russian uh, war against mm -hmm. Ukraine, um, I was just wondering on your views on uh, how much our values may be a quite flexibly used tool in geopolitics. Mm -hmm. Who is that to? Question maybe to uh, Professor Kishore, because I'd really like to hear the Asian view on that. The yeah. Asian view on that. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I'm very, very glad you raised that question because I, I view, I've heard the phrase very often today: uh, our values, our values. The question then becomes, who's the our? Because if you look at the world's population, 12 percent of the world's population lives in the West. 88% lives outside the West. So does the hour also refers to the values of the 88%. And I, I say that because it's important to understand that the dynamic of the 21st century will be very different from the dynamic of the 19th and 20th centuries. The 200 years of Western domination of world history are coming to an end. We're moving from a mono-civilizational world to a multi-civilizational world, where you'll see many successful societies, many successful civilizations. And guess what? Each civilization has its own set of values, right? Muslim societies, I can tell you, will always have different values from Western societies. It doesn't mean one is better, one is worse, but you've got to respect and understand that different societies have different values. And so when, when you keep saying that, you know, we've got to respect our values, we've got to respect our values, I would say maybe you should add another phrase, maybe we should also respect your values. You know, it's very, so very important. Because at the end of the day, you, I can tell you for sure that many of the societies that are emerging will not become carbon copies of Western societies. And if you take China as Exhibit A, you cannot expect a society with its 4,000 years of history, culture, tradition to evolve and become a replica of a Western society. Now, of course, you hope that China will be open, cosmopolitan, engage with the rest of the world, sensitive to global interests, sensitive to other societies. We can aspire and try and achieve that. But you can't ask for China to become a replica of a Western liberal democratic society. So that's what, that's, that's, I think managing that multi-civilizational world is something that I think businesses should also engage in. 
I, can we'll, I just we'll, say we'll come thing? to you in a minute, but there's a few people who want I, to I need to say so say we'll, say we'll yeah. No, I think I, I love Kishore and everything you stand for, but I do think we have global values. We have a framework of UN values, the international human rights, we have child rights, we have definition of what, what a war crime is, we actually have we have sustainable development goals. We actually have a big pile of internationally recognized rights and values that I think are universal. And we need to live those values and expect of the global community that will do the same. So I, I, I don't like this idea that each country or each region will have their values because we worked so hard since the beginning of making the UN, of creating common human values, which we should all respect. I, can I say I agree? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was ambassador to the UN for over 10 years. I know you were. <laughs> and I was protecting all the UN values, but that, it, it's very, very significant. If you really want to understand what the world thinks, go to the United Nations, go to the United Nations General Assembly, have a debate in there, and then listen. So let's, let's just hear from Alan and David do you want, if you want to add anything to this as well, and then we'll go to the final question. Well, I think everyone's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is not... He's a diplomat. <laughs> I, I don't think it's about who's right, who's wrong. And again, we're talking in the context of a very difficult reality that we're living today, and this to a large extent is informing, I would say, or, 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 or influencing what we're saying. The reality is there are multiple countries and multiple nations and multiple civilizations that are 4,000 years and more globally. They don't behave in the same way. There are sets of values that every country in the world has signed up to, to live by. These are legal obligations on every country that is part of the UN. And these are not things that you get to abide by at some time and not to abide by at, at others. This being said, the West also has doesn't have a lot of lessons to give because the West also have to live up to the values that are as well, I would say, foundational to our world today. So the reality is we're all to blame in this issue. And there are multiple conflicts globally today, but not all the conflicts have the same impact on our customers from a business point of view. And our customers are not reacting in the same way to each and every conflict. I also want to say some get more media attention than others. You mentioned, I think, the Muslim world. I mean, very recently, we had a number of issues in the Middle East, for example, on the fact that France wanted to stand up to its democratic values and basically freedom of speech regarding, uh, regarding an issue that happened there, regarding caricatures of, of the prophet, etc., etc. And we had customers in the Middle East saying, we should boycott France and we should, we should basically stop working with them. Mm -hmm. So this is not something what you're seeing today about Russia and Ukraine that's not happening elsewhere, okay, for other reasons. And it actually cost us a lot of, a lot of money. And we had to, 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 to basically take, take that into consideration and respect that across the board. I, I'm not saying, uh, or I don't think anyone is intending to say, that we should only do that when Western values are, are, are attacked or basically at stake. It's actually our global values that are at stake. Are we, allowed to, are we allowed to finish this or not? It, David wants to say one tiny, tiny little thing. Okay, I'm terribly sorry. It, we've talked about values, what we stand for, but in my view, at least as important is how we reflect those values in how we live and how we work. <clears throat> the relationships we have and what we share. Do we respect everybody? Do we engage them? And secondly, are we transparent, as was just said? That may matter even more than having the values. Thank you. Final word. We are now being asked to uh, play three-dimensional chess. Think about this. You had the x-axis, which was competence. Business knows how to do that. The second axis is ethical behavior. Business is learning how to do that. The third axis, <clears throat> which is new, is geopolitics. We have to operate on a local basis, we have to operate on a national basis, and we have to operate on a global basis. And the question of balancing national interests versus your global interests is at the core. 
I want to reiterate this value of quality information. 60% of people come into every situation distrusting. We're at a new low level of distrust in the world. Unless I have quality facts, I cannot make good decisions. We've got as corporations to be part of giving good information of both kinds, both sides, not just everything good for your company. What, what's the downside? The last point, this mass class divide that we've discovered today is corrosive and scary. And we have to do everything we can in the next months about food, energy, and health, because that is the litmus test of whether business <clears throat> is seen as a quality participant in our society. Thanks very much to the entire panel. It was brilliant, Thoreau. Thank you.